I thought so. This is uh, a study in uh, Richard Borkham's book, Jesus and the Eyewitness Accounts. Now, I, I, I agree with most of what Borkham's saying. I don't agree with all of it, but I, I agree with his general thesis. Um, but what I just want to do now is I, I want to play devil's advocate and I want to play the role of someone coming and taking on Borkham and criti critiquing him and one of the areas that we can critique him now is when he's trying to prove his point that w we should take the Gospels as serious eyewitness material because the living voice of investigating eyewitnesses that ancient hi Greek historians did is the same as say papyrus which shows uh, a uniformity of looking at eyewitness material from the Greeks right through to the right end of the Gospels up to papyrus. I noticed a problem with that in that if we look at papyrus he's not consistent completely about who wrote the Gospels. He talks about Matthew wrote Matthew and Mark wrote Mark but John the Elder wrote John which general tradition has it that the Apostle John wrote it so a, a historian who's trying to get eyewitness material has got his facts wrong so we need to um, think about that just for a second so we're going to think about the Gospel of John although there are several earlier documents both within the Orthodox stream and within Gnosticism that allude to the false gospel are quoted see the discussion below the first writer to quote unambiguously from the fourth gospel and to ascribe the work of John is Theophilus of Antioch AD 181 before this date however several writers including uh, Tatian a student of Justin Martyr Claudius Ap Apollinarius Bishop of Heraclius Athenagoras but ambiguously quotes from the fourth gospel as from as a form an authoritative source this pushes us back to Polycarp and Papias information about whom derives primarily from Irenaeus end of the second century and Eusebius the historian of the early church fourth century Polycarp was martyred in 156 at the age of 86 there is no reason therefore to deny the truth of the claim that he associated with the apostles in Asia, John, Andrew and Philip, who was entrusted with the oversight of the church in Smyrna by those who were eyewitnesses of, and ministers of the Lord. Irenaeus knew Polycarp personally, but it's Polycarp who mediates to us the most important information about the false gospel. Writing to Florinus, Irenaeus recalls, I remember the events of those days most clearly than those who had have happened recently for what we learn as children grows up with the soul and becomes united to it so I can speak even of the place in which the blessed Polycarp sat and disputed how he came in and went out the character of his life the appearance of his body the discourse which he made to the people how he, how he reported his converse with John and with the others who had seen the Lord how he remembered their words and what were the things concerning the Lord which he had heard from them including his miracles and teachings and how Polycarp had received them from the eyewitnesses of the word of the Lord who reported all things in agreement with the scriptures most scholars recognize that this John certainly refers to John the Apostle the son of Zebedee is for Irenaeus is concerned none other than John whom he emphatically insists is the fourth evangelist Irenaeus that the gospel should be fourfold in the sense already described was as natural as there should have been four winds as for the four gospels he wrote John the disciple of the Lord who leaned back on his breast published the gospel while he was resident at Ephesus in Asia in other words the name of the fourth evangelist is John and is to be identified with the beloved disciple of John 1323 I've got it I don't think Papias was actually wrong about talking about um, John the Elder okay I think 
that Eusebius didn't like and he, he states that clearly in the text when he's commentating about uh, Papyrus he didn't like the end time teaching the millennial reign and all the rest of it that Papyrus was, was, was stating um, and so therefore I think he's trying to muddy the waters and he's trying to put an emphasis on Papyrus was actually confused and, and, and got his ideas from John the Elder and not John the Apostle so I think that's why the confusion is there um, on that on that score so in other words Barkham's um, theory is intact yes people can get things wrong historians can get things wrong they can get facts wrong but if they're trying to be honest they do get us if we get to the eyewitness material it does give us access to something unique in that event um, if we prove it's eyewitness material then then what that means is that we have to think about whether it's credible whether it's consistent whether there are other testimonies, whether the background verifies what they're saying. However, I think presuppositions do play a part. Because if someone came to me and said, I've just investigated testimonies of people seeing UFOs in the 1950s. I wouldn't take any of that testimony seriously because the probability of I of of alien ships coming down to the to the to um, to the UK uh, not to the UK but to to the Earth the probability of that is it's not even one out of 100 it's not even it's just it's beyond impossible when we're talking about billions of galaxies and billions of stars in each galaxy and we we can't see life anywhere it, it's just an impossibility so if someone starts saying to me there are um ufos and eyewitness sightings and I look at I before I even look at the evidence to me it's just not a possibility I will look at the evidence I will try and be fair but at the back of my mind I'm thinking it just seems improbable to me I saw presuppositions play a, a role it's reasonable to consider these persons testimonies in the Gospels because of the God of the Gospels the God who created everything if he created everything it's not unreasonable that he could bring someone from the dead and that as a presupposition means that when you're looking at the evidence you're going to be more predisposed to look at it favorably if it seems to be consistent So I think that no matter no matter how fair and honest you are as a historian, whether you're uh, an atheist or a skeptic or agnostic, 
if you don't believe there is a God then no matter how much testimony you investigate you're never really going to come to faith and to believe in Jesus as, as dying rises you have to there has to be a point where the presupposition that God exists is part of your historical inquiry because at the end of the day if you don't believe there's a God even if you've got all the dots tilted and you say well Jesus uh, it was seen by these disciples etc and you've got that then that still leaves you there it doesn't move you into um, a belief that there is a God or that God rose Jesus from the dead I mean you can excuse me you can put uh, causes effects and causes in the equation how did how come the gospel Jesus resurrection uh, changed the apostle Paul how come the enemies of Jesus uh, didn't provide the body to put out the Christian faith you can provide all these cause and effects and gives you a strong pro probability that Christ rose from the dead but ultimately if you don't believe there's a God you won't grant that evidence as being significant to the proving of, of Jesus' ministry you would just say well if he said he was going to die and he rise again and he died and he rose again it was just coincidence it doesn't necessarily prove that it was a supernatural event But what the test, what what Barker's project does do is it is it 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 puts it more on the table that these things did happen that they the disciples did see these miracles they did see Jesus rise from the dead but what we make of it as moderns as skeptics I mean I'm not a skeptic but if you are a skeptic then that's a different matter but it means that we're getting closer to the historical event. So I think what it means is when we're defending the resurrection of Christ or the life of Christ that we have to challenge the skeptic not only on the objective historical information I and, and when I say objective that means that we do come at, come at it with a bias so we have to challenge people's bias and show ask them why they are coming to the material in an, in a fair objective way so we challenge your methodology, we challenge challenge them on their interpretate understanding of the facts and the interpretation of the historical Jesus. But also we have to challenge presuppositions. We have to go into an argument uh, of does God exist or not? Before we even get to the historical evidence, I think. That's my reflection so far on Borkham it's a very powerful tool uh, it's, it, it backs up the Christian faith strengthens the Christian faith but I'm just qualifying it as to how we can basically how you use all this in a practical form quickly it's basically you say to people I believe Jesus rose from the dead and they say well that's just your opinion and you can say well I can provide you evidence eyewitness material and you provide the fact that you go into all the historical reasons why the gospels are eyewitness material from ancient historians and the way they wrote then they might say well they might have got it wrong and you say well um, the evidence is against that because there's so much eyewitness material here to, to offset any any possibility of that but then they'll say well yeah but even if they saw a resurrected Jesus still doesn't mean we have to believe it doesn't prove it and then you can say well do you believe there's a God and say no and you, you give some arguments for that and you say well this God created us in his image and he rose and, and it says 
that he was going to raise Christ and he is risen Christ and if you believe the interpretation of this God and the scriptures then you know that's one way of looking at it that Christ did rise from the dead and it explains XYZ it explains the evidence it explains the reason why you're here etc